Hello, everyone. So, um, first about me. So, um, my name is Christoph. Um, I'm working in the QA department of our um, in memory database, SAP HANA. And this talk will show you a very, very short introduction about HANA itself because it's important for the rest of the talk and then about how we are using Python to test SAP HANA itself. So, let's get started with. SAP HANA, um, it's a relative new product of SAP. It's an in-memory database, which means we have some uh, storage engines, uh, a column store and a row store, which is really optimized to run in the main memory of a system, of a, of a server. And with the optimized algorithm, it's much faster to find things, to perform queries, and so on. And it fits very well for um, online analytic processing, so you can do normal analytic queries on it, or you can also use it for transactional processing. Um, a typical database, you install it maybe on just one system, but we can also um, build up a scale-out system so you have multiple nodes and connect each other to build a big database and then you can distribute your tables across the systems and so on. For you as a Python developer, it's actually not so interesting because your interface is most of the time just SQL and then you use the database. Um, so it's basically not so interesting about the very detailed insights, but who knows? So, um, HANA itself is uh, written in C++, so not so interesting for us. Um, but we deliver a lot of uh, management tools and commands, which are totally written in Python. And uh, one part of the HANA distribution itself is also a Python interpreter. So, I told SAP HANA is an in-memory database, which means you need a lot of memory but you can start from the beginning. So uh, we have, for example, uh, one small express edition. You can start with, uh, with it on your local um, notebook. You just need uh, 16 um, uh, gigabytes of memory, but you can also scale out and have a system with something like yeah, um, 48 terabyte of memory. And there are real customers which are running such systems, and it's still very impressive. So, if you take a look how you can uh, use SAP HANA or you can connect your Python application with SAP HANA, it's very straightforward and very simple. Uh, we have a Python client uh, signs basically the beginning of the time. Um, with the next uh, service package from uh, HANA itself, the Python client will be fully supported and has also support of Python 2.7 and Python 3. And then you interact with it over the typical uh, DPRP interface. So you open a connection, open a cursor, run some SQL, and you can fetch the result. But as most of the Python developer doesn't write SQL anymore, and personally I can totally understand this, uh, we have also some open source projects, or basically there are open source projects, to interact with the database. So there's one dialect for SQL Alchemy. Uh, you can run. Um, SQL Alchemy very easy with Fana, um, and it uh, makes a lot of more fun than writing SQL. Or there's also another open source project um, to use as a Piana as a data backend for Django itself. So let's talk a little bit about testing a database. Testing a database is not so different to testing a software because the database is just a software. So we have this uh, very typical pyramid. Uh, on the bottom, we have unit and component tests written in C++ because it's the main language of HANA. It's the main language of all developers. But if you start writing um, some kind of integration tests or very complex end-to-end -end tests, or um, so, then C++ doesn't fit very well anymore. And most of the tests are then written in Python. Um, one disadvantage is that if you write more complex tests, more integration tests, they will, bit, uh, will be a little bit slower and will be more expensive. So unit tests are much faster um, and are much, much cheaper 
typically. So let's take a look at our development process and how we um, integrate testing and quality assurance in this development process. A developer pushes a change into our Garrett. Um, Garrett is a very famous Git code review system and the whole HANA source code lives in one big uh, Git repository. Um, after the push from the developer, um, we trigger some quality assurance processes before the commit even reach any kind of branch. So uh, there will be no commit which will reach in, inside of a branch without testing, without building. And after the building and te uh, test processes are complete, and also other quality assurance things like code analysis, um, style checkers, or sanitizers in uh, the C++ coding, uh, there will be a review from a very dedicated team which reviews the, your test results, and at the end, they are voting, okay, it's good enough, or um, please try again and please fix the, uh, some failures. And after the review, your change will get merged into the repository. So, to build something like this, um, I mean, it's a very straightforward continuous integration landscape. Um, it's also very common to do this. Um, so, in 2010, it was like a very common landscape. So, developer is pushing to Garrett. Garrett will notify our Jenkins CI server about a new change. Jenkins will look in the configuration. Maybe there's a job configuration for it, and then it will trigger this job, place it basically in a queue, and if there are some nodes without um, or with available resources, uh, one node will grab the uh, job from the queue and execute them. Very straightforward. Um, let's take a look, a um, deeper look, into what such a job looks like. It, such job is basically um, divided in four parts, so you have to check out the latest source code, you have to build the database from the source code itself, um, we set up a complete database, and then we run the test. Very straightforward, and until now, looks like um, everyone basically does in continuous integration. And um, one special thing is already included in the 2010 version. We have a central database, because we are a database um, department, and we store all of our test results in this central database. And the developer can afterwards uh, take a look on this um, data via web UI, and we can still access on this old data, and I can still review um, test results from 2010. It's actually not so interesting anymore, but we are still able to do it. So, um, if you read the description of this talk, this talk is about scaling and how we scaled our test infrastructure. So, the main question is, so why should I talk now about scaling? So, because until now it looks like a very typical continuous integration system. So, let me try to prove it, that maybe we have some experience with scaling. So, right now our system is working for 600 developers, uh, totally distributed across the globe. This developer is pushing around 700 commits every day into the system, into the repository. We have around, oh, we have above um, 30 million lines of Python testing coding in our repository, and we are performing actually every day testing um, of um, um, 36,000 hours. So this is basically around four years. So we are running tests uh, every day of four years. We do this on a landscape of um, yeah, small 1,300 Jenkins nodes. And these Jenkins nodes are actually not so small, so we're not talking about uh, RVS small editions. We are talking about bare metal servers uh, in most of the cases. And we are using around 408 terabyte of memory for testing. It's just about testing. So we have much bigger systems with memory, um, but we're still using 408 terabyte for testing. 
So let's talk a little bit about how uh, we did the scaling, and I just picked four topics for scaling. So uh, one interesting part is uh, test runtime, how we optimize that. Uh, test scheduling is also quite important thing. Artifacts is also a very interesting area because you cannot um, uh, move so much data around. And then you have to provide a very healthy test environment, especially if you test on bare metal systems. Let's take first about test runtime itself. So this slide um, shows the uh, runtime of a Jenkins job of around eight hours. And you can see the job doesn't fit anymore on the slide. So you're pushing and you're waiting more than eight hours until your test result is available, until you know if everything works well. It's not so great, actually, from a developer perspective. And we started to optimize it uh, by applying a very common pattern from computer science, divide and conquer, or in our um, area, it's basically divide and test. So the first thing we did was uh, we separated the test job from the build job itself, which means we can now run the build on a different machine, on maybe a machine which is optimized for building uh, our product. And at the end, we run the test on a machine which is optimized for testing. So a very common example is that build machines has typically more CPUs and test machines has more memory. So, but actually this split now increased the time because you have now also this communication time, you have to transfer uh, the artifacts across um, the network to the different hosts. But this was a prerequisite. Now we can also split the test block into smaller test blocks which has also the benefit that in case one test block fails, then we can reschedule it um, and we can still keep the time for review by around seven, eight hours, which is actually uh, good enough right now. So let's talk a little bit more about test failures in our case. Um, tests can fail, and actually it's the intention of test. So you wrote something new, you don't thought about a maybe uh, unrelated component, and now the test is broken. Um, in case the test is broken, we currently run the strategy to rerun this test, to verify that this is now a real regression. You really broke something, and it's not caused by some sporadic failures, some kind of network latency issues or some kind of um, general infrastructure problems and so on. So um, after the rerun is complete and in case the rerun is still um, um, or the rerun is still uh, in a failed state, then we know, okay, it's a real regression and someone has to take a look at the results and take a look at the traces and decide, okay, what is the reason for this? So the main question is, um, who restarts failed tests? So you can imagine in case a developer pushes something and then goes, for example, um, uh, home, um, he actually doesn't want to um, get in the office at the morning and see, okay, test failed, I have to restart it, have to wait eight hours or one hour uh, until the test result is available. So. This is the reason why we started to thinking about a more intelligent test scheduling. And we thought more about test scheduling and we found out that test scheduling is basically about two parts. The first part is about configuration. Which tests should now run? Which tests are now interesting for this change? So, for example, we have different configuration for our multiple hundred Git branches with different components inside, that if you push in your topic branch, which is something like a feature branch, then we will run tests optimized or test basically for this particular feature. If you push against one hour integration branches, then we will run 
a huge suite of tests to avoid regressions in other components and so on. But we can also um, integrate things and we also added features like layer testing, which means we first do some kind of unit testing. So we run first the unit test in our infrastructure. And first, after this unit test are successful, we run the really expensive integration test. And then we run the really expensive end-to-end -end tests. And as we have a large developer base and a large code base, it can happen that someone breaks a test. And in case of you have a broken test, you cannot stop uh, to integrate new changes in your integration branches. It wouldn't work in such uh, scale anymore. And this is the reason why we have also some features um, and ways to handle such broken tests. So you can, for example, move a test into a quarantine and say, okay, we know this test is currently unstable. There are some bugs inside and we exclude this test in the, run, uh, in the execution to save runtime. The Another big thing about test scheduling is to observe the whole test run. So in case there's a failed test, he reschedules the thing. Or in case the test is now complete, he can automatically perform um, a review of the test. And the most important thing is basically um, after someone uh, push something, you actually want to know, okay, now it's complete because the test just runs eight hours. For this, we started to, to implement a more intelligent test scheduler, um, obviously in Python, because we really love Python, uh, which means after a build, um, the build will trigger our more advanced test scheduling. We call it the waiter. And the waiter will then uh, um, ask different systems about configuration, about um, states of certain things. So for example, in case you push something and you reference a bug inside of it, then we will take a look at the state of this bug and only in case this um, bug is in a, in a defined state in process, we will then start uh, the test execution. After the waiter decided which test should run, um, he will schedule it in, in Jenkins and will still monitor it in case there's a failure or some test block is missing or something, he will reschedule it. Um, at such scale, um, we have also to talk about queuing in scheduling of tests. So we have certain requirements. So for example, our nightly test should be completed in the morning or that bug fixes are a little bit more important than new features, so the test should run um, with a higher priority. And also that we should maybe finish, uh, start a test, uh, um, um, finish the testing of commits um, in case they are not fully tested and we have some reruns. Um, Jenkins currently only provides a first in, first out queue. And with first in, first out, it's really hard to implement such requirements. And our solution for this was also to implement it in Python again, because we love Python. So we built a prioritized test queue, which means we, um, the, the waiter is putting now the tasks to run a certain test into this queue, and this queue will sort them around uh, based on the priority, based on the content of, um, of the test task. And then a um, processor will fetch queue items from the prioritized queue and will distribute it across Jenkins hosts, uh, Jenkins masters, which is actually also a very uh, required feature to distribute across Jenkins masters because uh, we just learned that Jenkins doesn't scale well with uh, more than 350 server inside. So let's talk a little bit about artifacts. Um, one thing is that our installer is a little bit bigger than typical software products or than a typical Python package. Our installer is still uh, 15 gigabytes and is uh, living on an NFS share. After the build is complete, they will place 
uh, the installer on this share, and we will install from this share. And we have also test data in various ranges, something like four megabytes, but also across, um, above or until 800 gigabytes. And we are doing um, per week, actually, um, nine petabytes of data transfers just to transferring the installer and test data to the real host which are running the tests. And to optimize this, we introduced some kind of caching. So we just place a very simple Python script. It's around 800 lines of code before, our, before we call the installer and he will check is the installer already locally available and in case there's a cache miss, um, he will fetch the installer from the NFS share, place it locally in the cache, and then we can run the installer right uh, away from it. And we can also do the same thing for test data. So in case a test requesting some specific test data artifact, we intercept this call, and then we are fetching the artifact from the central shares on the local disk, and we can import it. And with this, uh, we actually saved a lot of traffic, and these implementation, uh, implementations are very straightforward and very easy. And we saved 66% um, uh, of traffic, and we are now only transferring, it's still much, but it's better than nine petabytes, so we are still transferring three petabytes of test artifacts every week ever, across our network. The next very important thing especially in uh, such a uh, test environment, is that you have a very healthy test environment. So you have to make sure that all your external dependencies are available. So as I mentioned, we have this uh, NFS shares with artifacts, with test data, but we are also testing distributed systems, so your local host is not the only host which is currently interesting for your test run. And as we know, external dependencies will always fail. But we have also to make sure that your local system is in a healthy state. As we are performing parallel testing on the same host, uh, we may, uh, have to make sure that there is no noisy neighbor around on the same host, a noisy test basically running on, your, on the host, which, for example, consumes all the available memory. And then it's um, um, very logical that uh, your test will fail because there's no memory available anymore. So to solve this, we started um, and implemented a health check, which runs before and after a certain test run. Um, and it checks all these dependencies, availability of external services, local memory usage, CPU usage, and so on. And also implemented in Python. So what does it look like Today, uh, today we have still Garrett, um, but Garrett doesn't trigger any more uh, Jenkins directly, or there's no Garrett trigger uh, anymore available. Uh, we have now um, dedicated infrastructure for building um, uh, the database itself, and after the build is complete, we get some notification, and we will start our waiter, which will then schedule. Um, the, the test tasks, and then some test processors will distribute them across our Jenkins landscape. And uh, the nice part is that if we now take a look what is currently running in our infrastructure, we will see a lot of things are now totally written in Python. So every blue box is now in Python. Um, also the build infrastructure is uh, heavily implemented in Python. And we still have our uh, central um, database with all the results and the web UI to review these results. And we are still heavy Python fans. So it's still very great that the learning curve is um, so easy to get started that non-developers can write tests for us uh, for the database. Um, we are very big fans of the community, so we are heavy, uh, heavily relying on open source tools like virtual and like pip um, we are heavy uh, user of sentry so we are um, um, storing a lot of exceptions in sentry um, we are big fans of the development velocity um, 
performance is nice, but to bring a feature which you had in mind in the morning at the afternoon into production is much better, actually. And that uh, Python is platform independent allowed us also to scale across typical architectures. So currently we are running uh, tests on three different CPU architectures and over 10 different operating systems versions. So just give me a very short outlook what we are currently doing and what we are currently trying to achieve. So we are currently thinking how we scale for across 3,000 nodes. Um, we are, have some POCs running uh, with Apache Mesos for doing a more resource-based scheduling approach. Uh, we are playing a lot around with uh, Linux containers, um, currently Docker, but maybe some other container engines could be also interesting to limit resources to ensure that your test run has enough resources locally available. And we are currently in a uh, step to migrate to Python 3, so a lot of the code base is still on Python 2, but there are some projects already migrated to Python 3. So thank you very much. Um, we are still hiring, so in case you want to play around with a lot of memory, you should definitely talk with me. So I think we have enough memory for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Christoph. Are there questions? Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. I'm curious about how do you test the failure scenarios? Like, the, I think Anna has like the distributed uh, structure. Uh, does it test on the Jenkins side, or do you test it with like the Python? Um, so we're testing it uh, in Python itself. So um, in case you have a distributed system uh, like HANA, um, it's possible for the developer to write test cases to say, okay, now I would like to um, intercept a certain network con uh, communication, for example, and then you can test the behavior, how it now works uh, without network between two nodes, for example. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, one question you mentioned, uh, you, s you run relevant tests first for topic branches. How do you do that? Like, uh, does a developer have to define them, or are you able to determine that automatically? Uh, currently, it's uh, configured. So the developer says, OK, I would like to run this test in my branch. Um, but we're thinking about ways how you map, for example, uh, source code to testing uh, to test coding, and then we can decide, okay, what, what should run. And we have also some um, proof of concepts running to use our uh, coverage data, for example, for such things. Hello. How do you split up your test suites so that they could run uh, in under eight hours? Do you do it by hand, or do you have something interesting, scheduling methods or something? Um, we are currently doing mostly by hand. So um, one of this test block contains multiple Python test scripts, actually. And then uh, we are trying to pick them together to uh, reach a runtime which is acceptable for us. Uh, we have some scripts which can generate these uh, collections, but it's not so sophisticated. More questions? I have a question, uh, also performance tests, part of the suite? Yes, we are also doing performance tests uh, with actually the same landscape. So um, all the performance tests, or many performance tests are written in Python also. And uh, we are doing also a lot of um, reporting and evaluation of uh, the results of performance testing with Python. Cool. More questions? That's not the case, so let's thank Christoph again.